So I don't work with several uh, materials, uh, materials for current and next generation reactors. Uh, uh, there are several materials that are of interest uh, to our group, uh, graphite, silicon carbide, uh, alloys 709 for fast reactor cladding, uh, zerk alloys, those are the workhorses for current light water reactor cladding, uh, UO2, that's a fuel, and actinide oxides in our thorium, thoria, you know, we are, you know, it's, uh, we are interested in that kind of uh, oxide fuels, molten salts for advanced reactors, uh, and also reprocessing. Um, this is a project which I have with Dr. Shannon here. I think I just said, you know, I have this project with uh, Dr. Boren. So several of these projects, I have collaborators within the university and also outside the universities uh, with national laboratories and also uh, uh, other universities. Okay, so uh, among all these materials, I don't have a particular preference for any. Um, uh, although, uh, depending on, well, uh, over the last several years, I have been gravitating towards uh, ceramic materials, uh, such as uh, graphite, silicon carbide, and also uh, UO2, uh, well, you know, actinide oxides. And uh, a small part of me likes, um, uh, like, basic physics, uh, uh, material science at a fundamental level. So I'm interested in nanoscale materials, uh, defects, thermal transport, low dimensional, uh, Low dimensional materials, phonon descriptors, beyond phonon descriptors, nanotribology, slow aging, creep, uh, frustrated glassy dynamics, and in general disordered materials. So, uh, the bunch of uh, areas which I'm, our group is uh, interested in uh, theory, simulations at electronic level, atomistic level, mesoscale, and also at uh, continual level continuum level. So, I generally do, I span across the scales. Among all these, um, and of course, uh, materials under uh, extreme environment. Particularly, we want to understand how materials behave in a in a radiation field, for example, neutron radiation field, ion radiation, etc. So, uh, interested in uh, physics of shock systems and uh, how to develop radiation tolerant and uh, uh, radiation tolerant fuel or, or materials. So among all these uh, uh, simulation methods, I have a particular attraction towards molecular dynamic simulations, and most of my work is generally uh, pert pertaining to this, this kind of simulations. Uh, so uh, in a sense, it's a time evolution of n number of atoms moving in an interatomic potential or, or force. So only one input is needed, and that input is actually the force between the atoms. So I'm showing two examples here, I can, you know, uh, on the left-hand side we have the solid state, on the right-hand side it's a disordered phase, liquid, for example, amorphous states, for example. And uh, the, the, the advantage of molecular dynamic simulations is that, uh, excuse me, uh, using only one input, which is a uh, force between the atoms, we can simulate all states of matter. Now, that's very different from the classical way we look at engineering materials. For example, we look at, uh, you know, like um, we have specialists in solids, we have specialists in gases, we have specialists in colloids and so forth. But at, uh, you know, if you go down all the way to the level of atoms, we can actually study all states of matter. And there is particular advantages because we can study disordered states. What happens if we bombard uh, material with neutrons? We can actually go down to the level of atoms and actually look at and, and, and figure out what is happening there. There are limitations too. We cannot, for example, study a huge system with billions and billions of atoms. We can study millions of atoms, but not certainly not the Avogadro type of numbers. But then we can get uh, real nice, um, uh, we can get uh, very useful information. We can compute properties. So let's, you know, let's look at you know, what we can do. Uh, solid state, you can see atoms vibrating back and forth about their equilibrium positions and liquid state or amorphous uh, state. Uh, liquid, I'm sorry, atoms are actually j jumping from one place to another. So this is an example of a diffusive state, uh, diffusion um, like, you know, as in liquids, amorphous states, whereas here uh, we just see only atoms vibrating back and forth. So, okay, now, how do I go back? Uh, let's see, nope, sorry. Okay, so if you look carefully uh, at one of these atoms, you can actually see atoms just vibrating back and forth. But if you look afar, actually you can see, what do, what do you see? You know, if you look at the whole set of atoms, what do you see? Kind of wave-like motion? 
so 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 we can study all those interesting physics so so those uh, those atomic modes are normally call, called as uh, normal modes and uh, normal modes are are important because they are closely related to phonons phonons are quantized lattice vibrations and uh, thermal transport is actually governed by the phonon interactions uh, especially in insulators and semiconductors. So we would like to understand how, how the, the atoms are actually vibrating. And from there, we get uh, phonon interactions, and we can compute properties like thermal conductivity. Why is thermal conductivity important? Important because there is no way to get the center line temperature of the nuclear fuel. It's only through calculation. Calculation needs input, and input needs properties. And properties, you know, this is one way to get it. So uh, you can actually measure it, but then you cannot do all kinds of measurements with all kinds of fission products, you know, uh, damages and so forth. So, so this is where uh, simulations would be extremely helpful. So uh, as I said, you know, I'm also interested in basic physics. So one of my previous students who is now a uh, postdoc with me. Uh, he looked at these normal modes and he said, and he actually found out that these normal modes actually obey quantum mechanics even in the classical regime. This was a little bit surprising for us. So, you know, we do uh, things like that too. Uh, so, uh, interesting, if you are interested, you know, let, let me know, we can have a discussion. But we also do more uh, uh, useful stuff, like, you know, for example, radiation damage. Now, this is a block of atoms. You know, we're going to uh, hit uh, one of the center, center atoms with a neutron, and uh, and uh, we'll see what happens. So I have taken away all the atoms. What you're going to see is a bunch of atoms coming out of it, meaning those are the displaced atoms after, the, uh, after one atom is actually knocked. So as we knock an atom at the center, we see a large number of defects coming in. And the defects peak at a certain time, which is about one peak a second. And then the displaced atoms uh, eventually go away. Now we can study other things like you know how these atoms move. We can have statistical mechanical metrics for this. And uh, we can study why certain materials are radiation tolerant and why certain materials are not. For example, here the green atoms actually move backwards, the red one moves ahead. This is silicon and this is copper. Uh, and without going into the details, you can see red and green atoms are all over the place, meaning these, these atoms in silicon are dynamically unstable. So this is one precursor which I've seen from molecular dynamic simulation, simulations which attest to the fact that silicon is easily amorphizable by neutron irradiation. And copper, in contrast, is a very stable uh, material. So this is one uh, useful thing which comes out and, uh, of, of simulations. And uh, this was published recently in uh, Phil Mag. So there are other things, you know, interesting things like in uh, UO2, thoria, and so forth. We have seen interesting uh, atomic-like diffusion mechanisms, which will have uh, um, an effect in accident conditions and, and so forth. So uh, let me not go into too much details, but all about atoms, that's what our group does. Thank you very much for your attention.